Hi, my name is Sister Kathleen Del Monte, and I serve as the Associate Vice President of Mission Integration here at the College of St. Scholastica. While I would very, very much like to be together in person to talk about our rich Benedictine legacy, for this time around, uh, we'll do it via a, a presentation that you'll view. And I hope you'll reach out to me with any questions or observations or just want to. So the College of St. Scholastica, as you all probably know, was founded in 1912. And this is a picture um, on the left of the monastery. And you probably, most of you haven't been here yet. I hope you'll come and visit us when it's all safe for us to gather together again. And this monast the monastery is located just on the other side of the chapel and library space. It's connected via a cloister walk right here. So here on the Kenwood campus, this property where the main campus of the college is located, we are actually three independent organizations. Over here to the right of the screen, all of this is part of the college. We have Tower Hall, we have the Science Building, Summers Hall, the BWC, the Residence buildings back here, and you can see the soccer field over here. Then next is the monastery and the chapel and library right here in the middle. And then towards our left, based looking at this photo, is all the Benedictine living community of Duluth. If you were here a few years ago, you might have heard it called the Benedictine Health Center. It's now been renamed to the Benedictine living community of Duluth. And at any given time in these buildings, there might be about 240 people in those buildings, everything from independent living for seniors to long-term care, post-acute care, skilled nursing, assisted living, uh, memory care, all of that in those buildings that comprise the Benedictine living community. So I'd like to share with you our mission statement. This is the mission statement of the Sisters of St. Scholastica Monastery, whose four mothers founded the College of St. Scholastica. So we, the Sisters of St. Scholastica, are monastic women. Monastic comes from mono, single-minded, single-hearted, who seek God in community through a life of prayer and work. We try to live in accordance with the gospel and the rule of St. Benedict, which is in itself is very much based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, we hope to respond to the needs of the church and the world through our ministries. So it's that last phrase of that last sentence that I would really call your attention to. We respond to the needs of the church and the world through our ministries. That is what animates us. That is what Benedictines have been trying to do since our founding over 1500 years ago. So St. Benedict and St. Scholastica, we learned from tradition, uh, were born around the year 480 in Norcia or Nursia, Italy, to an upper class family. And there is Norcia located on the map. Northeast of Rome, here is Rome, and here is Norcia, Norcia, Italy. And until about four years ago, this, um, this basilica of St. Benedict, um, located right over the birthplace of the twins, used to provide hospitality to over 50,000 pilgrims a year. Over 50,000 people a year would visit this location. Why do I tell you that? Well, that's to give you a sense of how widespread interest is throughout the world of uh, Benedictinism. And I did say until four years ago, sadly, this area uh, experienced a series of earthquakes in um, August four years ago, and then another series, unfortunately, in October. And so both this cloister walk and the, the, the church itself were very, very badly destroyed. What, what remains right now is only the facade. 
So that's the bad news. The good news is that the monks who live and work here are rebuilding. It's, it's very slow, it's painstaking work, but they are rebuilding gradually. So you might tuck in a prayer for the monks. We typically celebrate St. Benedict's feast day on March 21st and St. Scholastica's on February 10th. So I did say that the twins, Benedict and Scholastica, were born into an upper-class family. And as men in those days, not women, but the men, um, when they got to be a certain age, perhaps around your age, they would have been sent to study. And so Benedict was no different. He was sent to Rome to study. But he didn't like what he found. Think about what was happening in Rome um, around the year 500-ish. Roman civilization was very, very well into its decline. A lot of, of law, um, probably um, a lot of lawlessness. And uh, the way it was taught to me is that Benedict was very dissatisfied with what he felt was the irresolute living of his uh, confrere. So he basically left Rome. He kind of dropped out of school and left Rome and eventually made his way to Subiaco, where he lived as a hermit for three years. And there, this is actually a place that the, the cave that is believed to be where he lived as a hermit for three years. You can actually go there and visit. Eventually, um, after those three years, Benedict got a reputation for being a holy man. And so he was sought out he would go on to found 12 communities of monks. The most famous one is the Abbey of Monte Cassino. And this is what it looks like today. Photo on your right, built high up. Benedictines traditionally built high up wherever they build. And um, Monte Cassino is where Benedict would have written his rule. And it's also where the bodies of Benedict and Scholastica are interred. Now, this is what the Abbey looks like today. It was not nearly this large in Benedict's day. Actually, Monte Cassino has been very badly damaged or destroyed at least six times that historians are aware of. The most recent was World War II, the battle for Monte Cassino. So this, this image you're seeing here is the rebuild after World War II. So every time it was damaged or destroyed, it was always rebuilt always rebuilt. This is an image of St. Wahlberg Abbey. It's located in Eichstadt in Bavaria, Germany. And we, the Sisters of St. Scholastica Monastery, can think of St. Wahlberg as our great-grandmother monastery. And let me show you why and how that works. So if you start in the lower left, then you follow the arrows. So the twins are born in Norcia, Norcia, Italy, around 480. Benedictine ism spreads to England in the late 500s, to Germany in the early 700s. Specifically, in 1035, St. Wahlberg will be founded in Eichstadt. And then, fast forward from 1035 to 1852, and three women, and I would ask you to please remember that number three women who are very courageous and probably very prayerful, volunteer to leave Eichstadt, to leave St. Walburg Abbey, a very known, a very, um, very specific, clear, laid out way of life, cross the ocean to a land they've never been, not knowing if they would ever return, and they did, in some cases they did not and not having really any idea what their life would be like moving forward. Came with faith and determination to serve God and God's people. And they arrived in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania and founded the first foundation of Benedictine women in the United States. So St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, founded in 1852, is the first foundation of Benedictine women in the United States. Within just five years, four new communities of Benedictine women 
were founded. So that's quite a rate of growth when you think about it. Four new communities in just five years. One of those was in St. Cloud here in Minnesota. They, within about six or so years, moved to St. Joseph, Minnesota. And it's from St. Joseph, Minnesota that our founders here in Duluth come. So our foundress, Mother Scholastica Kirst, there she is on the right, was prioress, the leader, that's the title of the leader of the community, was prioress at St. Benedict's in St. Joseph, Minnesota for most of the decade of the 1880s. In 1892, she was no longer prioress and now Duluth had been growing and had become its own diocese and the first bishop, James McGulrick of um, Diocese of Duluth, the newly founded Diocese of Duluth, wanted his own foundation of women. And so Mother Scholastica and 31 other women volunteered to come to Duluth and found a whole new community. That's how our community here in Duluth was founded. We uh, established schools and hospitals throughout. When the sisters first arrived here in Duluth in 1892, they rented two townhomes in Munger Terrace. This building is still there. Uh, if, if you're coming up Masabi Avenue from, from downtown and you're coming up that hill, this is located on your way. This building was new in 1892. It had just opened. It was built for Roger Munger. And so the sisters rented two townhomes, one for their private living quarters and the other school for girls. You think about whose needs weren't being met in Duluth in 1892. There weren't a lot of educational opportunities for girls and young women. And that's something the sisters were experienced at and were able to do. So that's what they did. They must have really been filling a need because within three years, they outgrew their space and would move to another location on the corner of Third Avenue and and that building is still there. We no longer own it, but that became Sacred Heart. I mean, so all during those early years, I think Mother Scholastica was kind of keeping her eyes and ears open for land that they could build a monastery. And so the community purchased uh, three contiguous parcels of land and during the first decade of the 1900s. And it's kind of interesting to think about. They wanted land that was on the outskirts of town. So uh, I don't think of us as being on the outskirts of town, but I suppose in the 1900s, uh, I guess this hill was. So uh, these are the ladies. This is an actual photo from 1906. These are the ladies of Sacred Heart Academy. So they would periodically come to this property, this hill here on Kenwood, what is now Kenwood Avenue, to have picnics or for some recreation. And you've probably heard this quote before. At one point, Mother Scholastica was here on this hill. And think about it, there was a small working farm, but beyond that, no other buildings and uh, fields upon fields of beautiful uh, oxide daisies, little, little daisies. That's how it got to be called the daisy farm. So at one point, Mother Scholastica shared with another sister, my dream, is that someday there will rise upon these grounds fine buildings like the great Benedictine abbeys. They will be built of stone and within their walls, higher education will flourish. I would say Mother Scholastica got her, her dream and then some. If you start in the lower left corner and go move your move clockwise, the first, what became the first tower was uh, built in 1909. So happily Mother Scholastica lived long enough to see that building go up. That was to be called Villa Sancta Scholastica. The upper left, uh, what is now the theater was actually built as a gymnasium in 1921, served as a gymnasium for both the high school and the college. The upper right hand corner, the second tower and the wings were added in 1928. And then the lower right in 1936, 
Chapel, the library, the cloister walks, and Stanbrook Hall were built in 1936. And this is somewhat, the center photo is somewhat close to what we look like today. Gives you a sense of, of how things have grown over time. And that's just the Kenwood campus. Now look at that photo on the right. You might recognize that as the Health Science Center over at Bluestone. Houses are uh, OT, PT, and PA programs. And then we have other sites throughout the state of Minnesota. I suspect Mother Scholastica did not envision that kind of growth. And we have a very robust online program as well. Um, but I trust she would look kindly upon all of them. So, Think back to when I, I mentioned the women who volunteered to come from St. Wahlberg Abbey in Eichstadt. How many women did I say came from St. Wahlberg Abbey to St. Mary's in Pennsylvania? Three women. From those three women, every branch and every leaf that you see represents another community of Benedictine women. And this is only the branch of the family, the Benedictine family, that traces our roots to St. Walberg. There will be another branch of the Benedictine family that will come from Switzerland, Maria Rickenbach. But this tree before you is just those of us who can trace our history back to St. Walberg. So every branch and every leaf another community of Benedictine women. So if you follow the main trunk up and you make a right, St. Benedict's founded in 1857 in St. Cloud, Minnesota. They would later move to St. Joseph in 1863. Continue up that trunk and on your left, you see St. Scholastica in Duluth founded in 1892. And we actually have two daughter houses. One was founded in Winnipeg in 1912, same year as the college, as it happened. And the other was founded in Crookston, Minnesota in 1919. So here's a closer view. So follow up, make a right at St. Benedict's and a left St. Scholastica and our two daughter houses. So why do I show you this? Well, it's to give you a sense of how we cannot always anticipate the good that's going to come from what we do. So if you're ever tempted to doubt the power of a few, perhaps you'll remember those three women and all the incredible growth and uh, good works that happen because they said yes to a call. So let's take a step back for a moment and look at this thing that we call Benedictine or Benedictine is. So this is the first page of the Rule of Benedict. It's a very special copy of the Rule of Benedict. It's an illuminated copy. The illuminations were hand drawn by a sister of our community who has since gone home to God, Sister Mary Charles. And the calligraphy was done by Meredith Shivsky, who is um, actually a former faculty member here at the college. So, so the rule of Benedict lays out a way of life for living in community. And it's marked by a daily rhythm of prayer and work. We support one another in our ministries and in our seeking God. So there are many values embedded in the rule. Why? Because the rule is based on the gospel and there are many values embedded in the gospel. College chooses to, cho to focus on five, and I know you know these five. So let's take a look at these. And as we're going through these, I would ask you to consider what does this value mean to you? When I share examples of what we mean when we say community at the College of St. Scholastica, what do you think of when you hear that word? So for example, some of the things that we mean sharing the responsibility to create and support the kind of community that you wanna be part of. Community is not a passive endeavor. It's an active opt-in endeavor. 
If you see something that's happening that you don't believe is right, perhaps you need to speak up and say so. Also, if you don't see something happening that you think ought to be happening, it might be your voice that needs to be heard to spark a chain. When we talk about community at the college, we're also talking about creating a climate which promotes a sense of community, while at the same time valuing the uniqueness of the individual. That is quintessential rule of St. Benedict. Benedict was all about community, right? He wrote a whole a rule as a guide about how to live together in community. And yet, if you look at the underlying uh, principles in the rule of Benedict, you see that everything, everything Benedict says is always attuned to what really and truly helps the individual person grow. So I think of this climate um, as a dance. It's a both end. It's promoting the community, the commonwealth, the good, the common wheel, the good of all, while also valuing the very important uniqueness of each one of us. And when we talk about community here at the college, we're also talking about manifesting an ability to be adaptable to circumstances, but without compromising our own values. Respect, what do we mean by that here at the college? Well, for example, cherishing and promoting the worth of all human life, treating persons with dignity and reverence. There is nothing that you need to say or do to earn dignity. How come? That dignity is already yours by virtue of the fact that you are, that you exist, you inherently have that dignity within you. We're also talking about honoring and supporting the spirituality of each person, valuing the dignity of all work and promoting the participation of all persons in the decisions that affect their lives. Again, this is right out of the rule of Benedict in chapter three, Benedict talks about whenever an important decision is to be made that affects all members of the community, you call all members of the community together and you listen with the ear of the heart to what each member has to say, what each member brings to the table. And only then do you make the determination and, and the decision. Hospitality, what do we mean by hospitality at the college? Well, for example, creating a welcoming atmosphere, both personally and institutionally. What can I do as an individual with the people I interact with and we do as a college? What can you do as your Dignitas class? Listening and responding sensitively to all. Extending warmth and acceptance to all. And welcoming new ideas and being open to change. And I'm not saying that these are always easy. Personally, I sometimes find this very difficult, but I am saying that these are well worth striving towards. Stewardship, what do we mean by that here at the college? Well, for example, utilizing human resources responsibly. I, I trust that I am uh, respecting your time providing the wise and respectful use of all material and monetary resources, promoting the prudent use of natural resources and energy. And look at this last bullet. This is an aspect of stewardship that I had never thought of before I came to the monastery. But take a look at it. Finding time every day for work, prayer, and play to promote physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. And love of learning, what does that mean here at the college? Well, for example, preserving the intellectual and material heritage entrusted to us by past generations, transmitting the treasures of human culture to new generations, me that has the ring of a college classroom, Creating scholarly, artistic, and scientific works which enrich and enlarge human life. 
And as you progress through your college career and beyond, you too will contribute to that creating scholarly artistic works. And integrating both thought and action as complementary aspects of a full human life. It's the thinking and the doing. Again, it's the both and. Both are very needed and very important. So it's because of these five core values we've just been talking about and all the values that are embedded in the rule of Benedict that we try and provide for uh, a holistic in, um, integrated experience for our students. So I encourage you to consider as you progress through your college, your time here at the college, to um, be attentive to all aspects of, of yourself, body, mind, heart, and soul. And take the time and the attention to nurture all of those aspects. So now it's your turn. When you go back to look at those five core values, I would invite you to think about what does this value mean to you? When you hear community, hospitality, respect, stewardship, love of learning, when you hear that word or that phrase, what comes into your mind? What do you think about? What does that value mean to you? And then I would invite you to consider what are some very specific ways that you might manifest or live out or demonstrate this value in your environment. And you can choose the environment. It can be in the classroom, it can be on the field, um, it, it can be where, wherever you find yourself. What are some specific ways that you can demonstrate that value in your world? And the third question is, is in a way, another way of looking at the second from a slightly different angle. What are some ways others have demonstrated this value for you? For example, respect. You know, you know inherently when you are being respected and when you are not being respected. What is it that other people are doing or not doing that give you to know that you are being respected? What makes you feel respected? How do you know that? So what does this value mean to you? What are some specific ways you can demonstrate this value? And what are some ways others have demonstrated this value for you? So I thank you so much for watching. I hope that we can meet in person at some point. Here is my contact information and I hope you'll reach out and at the very least just say hello. All right. Many blessings to you. Thank you for watching and have a great rest of your semester. Take care.